Hi, I'm James McGuire here at AWS reInvent, and I'm talking with Ben Schreiner, head of AI and modern data strategy at AWS. Ben, thanks for talking with us, and uh, wow, there's a lot going on at reInvent this year. It's an exciting time for sure. Yeah, so, so many people. I mean, it's like the crowds uh, north of 40,000, I don't know the number is, but it's, it's a big number. Yeah, I haven't seen the final tally, but it, it definitely seems uh, bigger than last year, which is great, yes. uh, and a lot of uh, excitement and energy. You know, you made an interesting point about artificial intelligence and how companies are dealing with making the big change to AI is that the biggest difficulty isn't necessarily the technology itself. It's, it's people, it's change management, it's culture. So what does good change management look like in this very turbulent, difficult change to the AI world? So for the leaders out there, I mm -hmm. think uh, having a, a lot of empathy uh, is, yeah. is required. Okay. Uh, this is a leadership moment, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to bring our people along this journey. Uh, we need to set a course, have a North Star, mm -hmm. um, but the empathy for people are afraid, uh, and we need to acknowledge that and try to do our very best to uh, understand uh, why that might be, mm -hmm. uh, and then put things in place like training, uh, exposure, um, you know, try and make it uh, understandable why this transformation is happening, what's in it for them, mm -hmm. like how it's going to benefit them, mm -hmm. um, and really, uh, you know, taking an active role uh, and not ignoring the elephant in the room. You know, I, I, I love the comment about empathy. I think it's difficult, of course, because companies have spent a lot of money, they're on a budget, they've got KPIs, they've got revenue targets. What? Empathy? Oh yeah, right. We're empathetic as human beings, but we're in this tight box. I mean, I don't know if there's an answer to that, but it just it gets, it's easier said than done, uh, in fairness to the management. Ag agree completely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is why it's the hardest of the three. <laughs> right. Uh, because it is easier said than done. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is the people in the organization that uh, you know, create the culture, that execute on uh, the vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and these tools are, are all uh, just that, tools to help the human beings more be more effective and efficient. Um, and again, that, that acknowledgement of, of, of the potential fear and the uncertainty, uh, again, I do think is a, a major leadership moment for all the leaders out there that uh, they need to embrace and, and address. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the idea of agentic AI? Certainly, it's, I think it's the buzzword I hear in the hallways of reInvent this year. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, of course, agentic AI has a lot of potential. One of the issues that I hear executives talking about and customers talking about is how can we know that we can trust these AI agents? They're, sure. they're moving around the enterprise, or they're, they're doing actions, they're making decisions. Are they making the right decisions? And we can't have a, a human oversee every one of them because we can't afford that. And so how do we know we can trust these AI agents? Great question. Uh, the, the key there, and, and again, we're trying to uh, anticipate the needs of our customers and, and respond to them. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then there's a number of, of factors that go into that. Uh, we had an announcement uh, this morning about uh, uh, our ability uh, to have agent policy, where, uh -huh. where uh, inside of Agent Core, you can define what the agent, what tools an agent has access to. So you can, and I believe, that the human beings need to um, define what AI can and can't do on their behalf. That is our responsibility uh, as the, you know, the, the humans deploying these agents on our behalf. The organizations need to take a, a proactive stance. So we have uh, AWS uh, guardrails inside of Bedrock, which uh, establish some boundaries. Uh, the uh, agentic uh, policy is another level of uh, control. And then you heard today, too, uh, the uh, uh, the ability to have agentic evaluation. And this is, gets to your uh -huh. point of, when do you know when the agents aren't doing what you said you wanted it to right. do? And so being able to evaluate and monitor the agents uh, and then take corrective action you know, as needed if there's a drift from you know, what you had intended. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there were early innings, as we say, and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot still to be determined, but the announcements today uh, are illustrative of us trying to get ahead of uh, anticipated issues uh, and give our uh, customers and, and users the ability to set those controls and, and have that trust, uh, like you mentioned, which is critical for adoption, uh, as well as trust to the end users. Uh, 
Can, can that be thought of as an abstraction layer? I'm just trying to understand some of the things around, or, or is that not really a, 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 an analogy? That yeah, I don't know. Abstraction, this is more around governance and control is the way I would think about it. Right? Okay. It's putting boundaries around what is possible. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing we've done is uh, automated reasoning, right? So you, we've all heard of hallucinations, sure. right? And, and obviously, the more hallucinations, the, the that erodes trust, right? If I'm a user and I keep getting a, a, an answer that isn't correct, I'm... I'm not likely to use that anymore, right? Indeed, you're gonna, you're right. gonna erode trust. Right. And so this automated reasoning allows for us to mathematically uh, ensure or, or increase the probability that the answer is right. right. And therefore, establishing that trust and then ultimately adoption, right? If these agents aren't adopted and we spend all this time and money putting them out there and then they're not doing what we want and the people don't trust them, you, you create more problems than solutions. And that's right. what we want to avoid for all of our customers is we want these to add real value to the organization. Yes, yes, okay. All right, the idea of, of data and AI, because really every AI is actually a, is a data story. I mean, AI gets all the headlines, data really does all the work. I don't think everyone understands that. Agreed. Uh, you've talked about, you know, sometimes the data architecture might not be perfect. There's things people can do. What advice do you give to, to customers in terms of a better data architecture to move things along optimally? So data has been a problem for as long as I've been in technology sure. and probably as long as, in, as you've been. Indeed, yes. Uh, and it's, it's a hard problem. Um, and it's a, the reason um, it hasn't been solved is because it, it is a hard problem for many organizations. Right. And, uh, you know, many organizations grow through acquisition. So now you have two sets of data uh, that you have to, to, to deal with. And so I can understand how you get into a place where your data isn't where you would like it to be as an executive team. Right. Um, the reality, as you stated, is AI is only as good as the data it has access to. Mm -hmm. um, and so as far as best practices, and we, we talk quite a bit here at AWS about having a modern data strategy and, and viewing data a bit differently, viewing it as a product that could be consumed by all parts of a business. Um, and so mm -hmm. if you view it that way, uh, and all data is not created equal, um, and so we like to say uh, the best approach is to work backwards from what problem are we trying to solve, what data do I need to solve that problem, and then start talking about which model is best, how do I best architect. And that's a real important equation there because you're starting with a very defined, this is the problem, and then really looking at, do I have the data I need to solve that hmm. problem? And if okay. you skip that step, yeah. you may be more often than not disappointed with the results of AI because the data isn't there that it needs to give you the results that you need or anticipated. Are, are you saying that a company's data strategy should drive their AI strategy? I think they're, they're one and the same. Okay. I don't think you can have one without the other. Gotcha. Um, if you have an AI strategy, without a data strategy, then I would argue you're going to have some bumps in the road. Right. Um, and we see that with folks who've uh, done a great job in a, a POC setting where the data was very finite and very clean. And then when they roll it out more broadly, they realize that the data across the organization isn't in the same state. Yes. And that's where they have that epiphany. Yes. We want people to avoid having spent all that time to, to realize that and instead sure. realize that up front that Actually, you need to have it all. In order to scale to your enterprise, you have to have thought this through. Right, right. And it is complicated. It, it, it's not as easy as some think, yes. um, but it is solvable. Hmm. It's, it's encouraging to hear you say it is solvable. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, your sense of the future, Ben. I think this is really where companies want to go. If, if we looked ahead, say, two to three years, what are things going to look like in terms of agentic AI? This new world of agentic AI is going to really change things. All these workers side by side. My agent will call your agent. Um, what, what are we going to see in the future? So I've, uh, I've said this, and uh, I think we're the last generation of, of human managers that manage just humans. Right. And so right. the future manager is going to have agents that they're responsible for and people that they're responsible for. Right. And those, the, the combination of the two are going to get work accomplished. So yes. work fundamentally is changing as we speak, I'm okay. sure in your profession and certainly Absolutely. in mine, yes. uh, and, and probably for everyone out there, um, we're right. seeing this evolution. As managers and leaders, right, we need to uh, embrace that uh, and, and make sure that we continue to advance uh, both productivity 
uh, and the outcomes that the business needs. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, I think in two years' time, you're going to see the uh, uh, and, and the World Economic Forum has a, a jobs report that came out last year. Oh, okay. That, that talks about the skills needed in 2030. Okay. Uh, and it's interesting. A lot of the skills that are going to be in high demand in 2030 are are, are human skills, critical thinking, uh, you know, lifelong learning, uh, curiosity, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to to communicate and, right. and influence. Yes. All those human skills become higher valued, more important in the future right. because we're going to have these bots doing things that we, the humans, don't want to do anymore. These automated tasks, the mundane things that you know, are easily repeatable and replicable or, or automated. And so mm -hmm. I think ultimately uh, in the next two years, you're going to see uh, us spend more time being creative and inventive, uh, more entrepreneurship. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be easier to develop agents and software. And so you're going to see a lot more startup solving problems, which is exciting, and you're seeing that already uh, you know, today. So I, I don't see that slowing down right. uh, in the next couple of years. But it's going to be, it's going to be exciting. I think uh, you'd agree. Uh, there's more change now, uh, a faster pace than, than, than ever before. Yes. And I don't see it slowing down. If you look at the investments that we're making uh, at every layer, uh, you know, whether it's chips, uh, automation and choice, or, or in the software itself, we're trying to make it easier for people uh, to embrace uh, this technology mm -hmm. and to figure out how to use it to get the biggest uh, impact they can for their business. I think it is a little ironic in a sense. This technology that almost mimics us makes our very core qualities more valuable. Indeed, yeah. Right. It, it has not replaced the core of us, but, no. you know, but it, has, it, it helps us, ideally. I, I, I'd, I like to say it's liberated us uh, or can liberate us from, again, doing the parts of our job that... We all have parts of our job that maybe aren't our favorite, right? Um, and certainly, uh, you know, my team did. Uh, and uh, one of the things we did was develop an agent to resolve some of that data entry that's required as part of their job, but was mm -hmm. very time consuming and not exactly intellectually uh, stimulating or rewarding. Right. Um, and so now the agents save them, uh, you know, probably a day uh, a month at well, least, okay. which is a lot. And now they can spend that day talking to more customers, which is what they enjoy doing. Yes. So the quality of life uh, has improved on my team. And uh, again, I think uh, a lot of folks are going to have that revelation that these bots and these agents working on our behalf free us up to do things that we enjoy and, and, and pique our, our intellect. Hmm. Ben, I think you've said it. Uh, a lot of good stuff. It's always good to check in with you. Uh, thanks so much. Always a privilege. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right.